Matt Walsh has a lot to say about trans individuals. One of those things is the statement that this is something new, something the world has never seen before. That's not quite true. I'm going to give two examples of trans identities in the Bible and go over the biblical teaching concerning this belief practice. Now, before we start, let's address the elephant in the room. Why have you never heard any of this before? And the answer is very simple, because the ancient Hebrews were describing the practice in a very different way than how we describe it now. So, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to reduce this whole thing down to its most basic essence. The key element to understand the trans phenomenon is the question of how we perceive truth. When somebody asks you, what is truth? There are only four possible ways to answer the question. You can give the relativistic answer, it doesn't exist. You can get the pagan answer, which is, I can manipulate the truth if I can just figure out magically how to do it. You can get the monotheistic, so the biblical answer, that the truth is, you know, the truth, no matter what I think of it. Or you can give the humanist answer. The truth is whatever I say it is. My truth. The increasingly secular society of the modern day is increasingly giving the humanist answer. My truth. But we're not the first society to do this. There was at least one other. The ancient Mesopotamian city-state of Medicaid held the same individual truth belief system. But, you say, I've never heard of Medicaid. Yes, you have. You just don't call it that. You and I use the pejorative term, the insult word that the Hebrews gave it. You see, the monotheistic Hebrews took a pretty dim view of individual truth. They thought that without objective standards, that human thinking would become disorganized and veer off into mental illness. And so, they gave Medicaid a name that reflected this. Medicaid really means land of Akkad, but the Hebrews dubbed it the land of confusion, or in Hebrew, Babylon. Now, we get a ringside seat for the final days of the land of confusion in the book of Daniel, the first four chapters of which are largely centered on the ruler of Babylon, a man we know by another pejorative. His name was really King Nabonidus. We call him Nebuchadnezzar, the Hebrew word for an extra-large container of wine. The reason for this is that the main Hebrew metaphor for Babylonian thinking was the so-called wine of madness. They thought that individual truth led to convoluted thinking in the same way that alcoholic intoxication leads to convoluted thinking, and so it was a natural metaphor for them. If buying into Babylonian thinking was like drinking the Kool-Aid, then Nebuchadnezzar was the Kool-Aid man. And the first four chapters of Daniel show us exactly what this looked like. We're told that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and wanted it interpreted. But Nebuchadnezzar, like any good humanist, was skeptical about metaphysical claims. He wanted proof that his magicians could do actual magic. So he proclaimed, either you magicians tell me what I dreamed, or I kill every one of you. The Hebrew prophet Daniel interpreted the dream. It was a vision of a statue with a golden head, which represented Nebuchadnezzar's golden city of Babylon, the height of civilization at the time. Faced with evidence of the divine, does Nebuchadnezzar change his stance and become a Hebrew-style monotheist? Nope. He does, however, turn the vision into reality by having a giant statue built just outside the city. The text never actually says that the statue was him, but I think the idea that it was a replica of him from the vision is probably one of history's safest assumptions. Now, the story says that next to this statue, Nebuchadnezzar sees another miracle, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego surviving a dip in the metal smelter. That makes two. Does Nebuchadnezzar change his beliefs in response to repeated direct experience? No, he does not. Which brings us to a second dream. This one, not so complimentary. This one is of a tree falling over, pure collapse imagery. A top-heavy society, well, at this point it's a person, which is going to prefigure the collapse of that society, and Nebuchadnezzar is that person, reliably stated to him, by the same guy who miraculously told him about the last dream. So, what does Nebuchadnezzar do in response to this? Does he become a monotheistic ancient prepper getting ready for societal collapse? No, he does not. Instead, he goes onto the ledge, literally, and proclaims himself the cause of all Babylon's greatness. Babylon, a city that was well over a thousand years old before Nebuchadnezzar was even born. And this is where he goes trans. But wait, you say, a minute ago, we were talking about individual truth. That passage makes it sound like this was something that was imposed on him as a punishment. It can be both. This is the 6th century BC. Modern psychology simply does not exist yet. 
have an affective disorder leading to a breakdown a la King Saul, we describe it in terms of an evil spirit from God. Heck, the Hebrews consistently refer to the prophecy that one day the Babylonian Kool-Aid, the wine of madness, would become a global phenomenon, is rendered in terms of divine authority. That's just how they described things. And on top of that, it's still how we describe it, as something delivered externally. Minotaurs? No mention of individual truth. No, this article talks about society. But again, we're dealing with a good humanist here. So it's society and not God that is making the difference. And of course, it's seen as a freedom rather than as an imposition and certainly not as a punishment. Still, all I've said so far is that it could mean he changed his identity. But then again, it could mean that this happened against Nebuchadnezzar's will. So why do I think it's the first? Two reasons. Number one, it explains how he stayed in power. Seven years is a long time to crawl on all fours. We can give examples of King Strain off into mental illness. Here's part of the list from Wiki. It's mostly European monarchs from the late medieval on. There's a reason for that. By the period of the late medieval, most kingdoms had functioning legislative organs like the British Parliament. So if the king became mentally ill, you still had a government. There's only two names from that Middle Eastern ancient world here on this list, and one of them is Nebuchadnezzar. And the second one is Aten Aachen. He's on it for becoming a monotheist, so I guess Nebuchadnezzar would have made the list even if he had converted. <sighs> Come on, Winky. And most of the other examples are Roman. We have to hold off on those because our second biblical example is on that list. We talk about ancient Israel as a theocratic state, but the reality was that almost every nation of the ancient world outside of the Greek city-states were theocratic. And in nearly all of them, the pagan ruler was seen as a semi-divine connection between the physical and the godly plane. If that guy wasn't functional, then the entire religious political system would have lost legitimacy. Here, when it says Nebuchadnezzar was driven away from men, it probably means he was sequestered at an estate far away from the palace where foreign dignitaries, who would not have understood him living out his authentic self, couldn't lay eyes on him. But Nebuchadnezzar would still have been able to rule as semi-divine. In fact, the trans identity here might have actually helped in some ways. Because the main feature here is what he identified as. The wiki article mentions the traditional diagnosis of boanthropy, thinking that you're bovine. And then everyone assumes that he thought he was a cow. But the passage doesn't say cow. It says ox, which was not seen as bovine in the ancient world. Just like in the modern day, where now people connect themselves to things like cats and mermaids for the girls because they're seen as complex and feminine. Dogs, dragons, wolves for the males, all having positive connotations. I'm still waiting for the first I identify as a banana slug or as a three-toed sloth. Well, it was the same here. In the ancient world, the ox was the primary symbol of strength and power. Represent the pagan god Baal as an animal? Here he is, an ox. Moloch in Canaan? Chemosh and with the Midianites? Amun, the father god figure in Egypt? All gods, all central to the pantheon, all oxen. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. I bet real money. He's snorting, he's eating grass, he's, use your imagination, while still communicating with his officials in some way. The ceremonial, religious functions of the Babylonian state? Driven away from men might mean sitting those out. But it might not, all while living his authentic ox self. Probably, it wasn't much different than this guy. This is Commodus, the Roman emperor from 177 to 192 AD. He identified as Hercules. No, really. He walked around Rome wearing a lion hide like this one. He also, at one point, buried a group of slaves up to their necks in the Colosseum, then bashed their heads in with his club. Every historical account will tell you that he was acting out the myth where Hercules fought the Titans as they rose out of the earth. Of course, that's not how it works when you create your own truth, is it? No, in Commodus's mind, he was fighting the Titans. This list, 
Rome had a lot of effective leaders over the course of their long history, but oftentimes, particularly when the emperor was groomed from a young age, they would tend towards megalomania and narcissism. Caligula considered himself trans-god. So did Caesar Nero, Mr. 666 himself, who had the statue of the Roman god Jupiter dressed every day to match whatever he was wearing. The reference here is to the use of phylacteries, leather boxes holding a tiny scroll of the Ten Commandments to the hand and to the forehead. In other words, a symbol of how the Hebrew was meant to use the Ten Commandments to mediate their thoughts and control their actions. Here, we're being told that the day will come where people will use Nero-type narcissism to mediate their thoughts and actions. And if they don't, they won't be allowed to buy or sell. They will be canceled from the culture. It's a neat guess. When Babylon collapsed, because apparently none of the individual truthers wanted to fight the Persians and maybe die for something other than themselves, the only truly humanistic society of the ancient world died out. Our humanism has no direct connection to theirs. Ours comes from a Christianized society, so a society that bases its meaning on Christian themes, but that increasingly denies an objective metaphysical source for that meaning. And what does the Hebrew Bible say that will lead to? In Matt Walsh's trans debate on Dr. Phil, he was asked this common question. There's biological sex, and then there is gender identity. Part of me wants to ask why you care so much, uh, because right. it's really right. not that big of a deal. Oh, yeah. Can I answer that? In the next video, we'll get the biblical answer. It's a passage called the Bowl Judgments. Literally, what happens when the wine of madness is poured out on the nations of the world, as if the Almighty was dumping bowls of it on us? This is David Reichert from The Bunker. Our second book, Fluid Shock, is now available from our publisher or from Amazon. Don't miss the next book in our award-winning pandemic horror series, The Holocaust Engine. Link below.